Okay, we're back, we're live. We're so happy we're in a new year, a happier year uh, here on ThinkTech. And we're doing Global Connections today uh, with our regular guest, uh, General Dan Leaf, Dan Figleaf. Uh, welcome to the show, Dan, and uh, Happy New Year. Aloha, Jay. Thank you very much. And uh, Feliz Nuevo Año, as they say in the Pacific part of Latin America. Ah, okay. I'm going to write that down. Um, so today we're going to talk about ASEAN. And we're going to talk about uh, going in on ASEAN, the reference being uh, to Joe Biden when he gets to be president here soon, um, and to see what kind of policies uh, you know he should consider, uh, you know, in 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 foreign relations with ASEAN and the nations, the ten member nations, I believe, of ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand what ASEAN is today. We need to understand what it means to the United States, what it means to China, of course. And uh, what you know, what its current um, economic status, political status, social status is, uh, and what its uh, expectations are. And we only have nine hours for this show, so we have to really hurry. Not enough. Not <laughs> enough, Jay. There are ten member nations. One of them will be shorted, and that's not the ASEAN way. <laughs> so what? Well, what is what is ASEAN? I guess it's um, uh, Asia something. The Asia. Yeah, association or alliance of the association Southeast, Southeast Asian nations. There you or go. ASEAN. That, that's easy. And yeah. um, so what and it has the 10 members, which are mostly in Southeast Asia or around Southeast Asia. Yeah, they're notionally in Southeast Asia, but they're very diverse. And I've mentioned that first, I think, because they're Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, Malaysia, Cambodia, Cambodia. Laos, Singapore, and Brunei. And yes, I did just read that, but I could have done it off of uh, my memory because I've been to all 10 member states. Now, having been to them, they are very diverse. And that's part of the beauty in the quandary of ASEAN. They don't have the same interests necessarily. They're built to be a consensus uh, reaching organization. And how do you reach a consensus with those diverse nations and interests that they have? And because of that, it ahead. would be in their interest to join up. I mean, it's, it's nice that they have this economic agreement. I'm not sure how effective it is just now, but yeah. uh, and that you know, it's a it's a it's a security pact as well, I guess. But but query is it the first step along the way to having a, a kind of EU um, in in Asia? Well, no, it's not the first step to an EU or a or a NATO or a Warsaw Pact. Uh, or any name any other, SARC, any other organization. ASEAN, I think, is truly unique. And the skepticism that you kind of implied in your, it's nice that they have, um, I think is matched in a lot of our more experienced and more knowledgeable than I uh, am diplomats and big thinkers and things like that. Because ASEAN is not in a, we have done this typically effective organization. They don't always accomplish much because they can't reach consensus and they're torn in different directions internally and externally. And there always are frictions big and small between the members, but there's a stability to that lack of movement. And one way I like to express it is ASEAN doesn't always make things better but they almost never make things worse. Mm -hmm. And they, I guess, were formed in, around, in the late 60s. And one of their uh, bullet points in their CV, if you will, is that the Southeast Asia is far more stable and less conflict torn than it was in the turbulent 60s and 70s. Yeah, it's the only question of the yeah. ghost of Christmas future. I mean, if there was no ASEAN, things would not be as good. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, that they must have participated in APCSS, uh, which you Absolutely. commanded for several years. And I, I wonder what, yeah. how they presented to you as, um, as participants there. Well, we had participants from all 10 member states, of course, representing their countries. But we also brought U.S. people affiliated with ASEAN and ASEAN staff members in that capacity. And uh, so ASEAN was represented. And, it is a, an organization of considerable standing because so many countries outside that 10, person, 10 member circle want to influence them and they want part of the business and they want 
you know, the geopolitical influence. So um, it has significant standing and uh, is well regarded throughout the region. You know, it's a point of pride for the 10 member states. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they never make things worse. I'll give you an example of where I saw the influence of, of um, ASEAN, and that's with our engagement with Myanmar, also known as Burma. And uh, that is as we began to haltingly become engaged with Myanmar, and the APCSS was the lead DOD organization, it is a Department of Defense organization, for official engagement with uh, Burma, Myanmar, choose one. Uh, the ASEAN member states, not just in within the ASEAN official circles, but in the states themselves, very much encouraged us to do that because they wanted to help a fellow member state that was coming out of a period of extraordinary darkness. And, and there is a sense of making their region better and making each other better and getting beyond bilateral relationships. So many of the countries I listed have their bilateral relationships, just as the U.S. has more treaty allies in the, in the Pacific than anywhere else. But those are easy to have other sides against. And a not unified, but integrated ASEAN, where they are working together and they have regular forums and economic efforts and climate e efforts and some security and um, security and sense of peace and stability efforts uh, doesn't pit one against the other. Yeah. It, it, go ahead. What about new members? Um, you know, what about, for example, because uh, you know, geographically they're all kind of around in or, and around Southeast Asia, but what mm -hmm. about Taiwan? Could Taiwan ever join? Is, is it a geographical limitation so that countries outside of a certain, you know, a certain parameter around Southeast Asia cannot join? Is, is there a likely expansion of ASEAN going forward? Well, let me start with the first question because that's a different answer. Taiwan's unique status, not seen as a nation by most of the world, including the US, but as a, an entity uh, would prohibit, would prevent it from being included ASEAN, not to mention the <laughs> apoplectic re reaction that one would get from, from uh, <laughs> China. In fact, I'm surprised I haven't gotten an email yet now that you've said that uh, about that for including what they see as a renegade province, province and yeah. that's not for today's show, but someday we'll, we'll debate the merits of that. So yeah. Taiwan, no. Um, more, uh, more members beyond that, I think are unlikely, not so much of geography, but as I said, they've already got a kind of a tough enough challenge um, there are a couple of obser observer nations, East Timor is one of them, and um, I'll think of the other in a second, uh, Papua New Guinea maybe, mm -hmm. but, but they've, got, they've got a big enough biscuit. They rotate the leadership the, of ASEAN annually amongst the 10 member states, and I don't think it would enhance things. It's, first of all, it's not an in expansive approach. They don't, they don't, aren't trying to rule the broad in Indo-Asia Pacific region or, or anything else. They're trying to make their region more stable, more secure. What about uh, trade? I mean, are, are there trade incentives here like, uh, you know, reduced tariffs or um, tariff-free relations between the members? They have a strong focus on trade and generally promote free trade. Um, that's always complex, and uh, but that, that really was part of the uh, basis of the founding of ASEAN. So very active in trade, as I said, climate uh, in the security realm. There was a, an in initiative back in the 90s to create a nuclear-free ASEAN, um, and that, that is as complex as, uh, as all nuclear issues in the, the nine member states. Uh, agreed that uh, the ASEAN region, Southeast Asia, would be a nuclear free zone, but Singapore uh, abstained um, in that case. 
from the vote. So they didn't reach that consensus, but it didn't break the organization mm -hmm. or the initiative. Mm -hmm. And we can speculate why Singapore chose to abstain, but I didn't speak for that country either. Yeah, it could be any number of reasons, including reasons that are external to ASEAN, you know, political. Yeah, like the global. U.S. relationship and port yeah, yeah. calls and things like that. So yeah, yeah. I don't know that that was the issue, but it, it's complex. And, and ASEAN, in my mind, is sufficiently um, loosely chartered to live with the complexities. Yeah. If it became more rigid, more... You know, look at look at Brexit and the the challenges that the rigidity of EU or European Union regulations, et cetera, uh, have led to in that organization, and also the expansion in size. So, if I was in the ASEAN Secretariat, I'd look to Europe and go, "Now nah, we're good." <laughs> we're, gonna, we're not going to do what they did. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the other thing that comes to mind is you mentioned, you know, these countries, and some of these countries are bigger. Some of them are economically powerful, some of them more militarily powerful, some of them have better, more robust global relations. You know, I mean, Singapore is not the same as Laos. Um, and so, you know, and, and you also mentioned that the chairmanship, so to speak, is rotated around the members. Mm -hmm. But some, some members, Dan, must be more influential than others. Am I right about that? I think that logic and simple math would say that's the case. But I think the truth is it's a pretty balanced organization. Uh, the bigger, more powerful, more developed countries do influence the other countries, but also they try to help. And that was the, you know, the push behind a strong desire for many of the ASEAN uh, citizens that I talked to citizens of ASEAN member states who wanted us to assist in the transition to true civilian government in Myanmar um, to get it right. Uh, I'll give you another case. Laos, a very small country in population and not with a lot of economic throw weight, um, was going to be the ASEAN, the, the leader of ASEAN for uh, a year when I was going, when I was at APCSS. And so with encouragement from other member states, APCSS held a workshop, and I've got a picture of that. So the purpose of the workshop was to assist the Lao government in properly executing a big event. And because the U.S. is the way the U.S. is, and I say that in a straight line back from a long time ago, so I'm not making a political discrimination, um, that that was our altruistic goal. Laos was going to host a very important meeting of nine other member states, and if they were going to get anything out of it, they had to be able to execute it. Do the governance of the event, the logistics of the event, all of those things properly. And so we held a several-day workshop in Vientiane, lovely city, by the way, and um, uh, it, and the Lao were able to exercise their one-year leadership role pretty well, I think. And it varies, but but it's there is no single big dog. A couple of the member states might like to think they are the largest canine in the crowd, but but it's Asia. And um, Jell is better than cement sometimes. Yeah, well, uh, democracy among them, that's admirable. But you know, there. But so many of them depend on the Mekong, and two hundred mm -hmm. million people. You know, their lives are dependent on the the Mekong, and China could shut the Mekong off on any given Tuesday, um, and that must be. They are the big dog, except they're not necessarily a member, but they, they're certainly, what shall I say, held in awe, uh, or in fear, um, by the members of uh, ASEAN. For both simultaneously. <laughs> right. How does that work? I mean, what what is the general relationship of the member nations around the Mekong, I suppose, um, and uh, the the relationship of ASEAN as an organization with China? Okay, so I am not privy to, and I haven't done research on Mekong River initiatives specifically, but 
I'd, I'd say to our viewers who are probably even less um, informed or aware, but that's an, a hugely important waterway uh, for all of the, the states of uh, China, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, in particular, Myanmar to some degree. Okay? And, and that's, that's a lot of people and a lot of livelihood and a lot of, of ecology um, there. So it, de it depends is the answer, of course. Um, ASEAN's role is to reach consensus and not disadvantage any member states too horribly. But while the Lao government may be very concerned about what China is doing with dams and stuff, the Thai government also is naturally concerned with what the Lao government is doing to counter or deal with not just any Chinese interaction on the waterway, but their own interaction in, in, in waterway management. So uh, without without having read up on the specifics, uh, there are several, uh, it's not just ASEAN, there's a, a more specific Mekong River initiative that, that's important to it, but, but ASEAN's role is bound to be reaching consensus and balancing the competing interest needs and concerns of the member states that, so that nobody gets Blood. Uh, in, yeah, in yeah it, it reminds me too that, um, you know, when, when COVID first started, I want to say mm, February, March, and it became, you know, threatening. Uh, Vietnam, which has had a pretty good record in dealing with COVID, they have really mm -hmm. minimal yeah. cases all this time. They, you know, they are to be complimented. Uh, they shut their border with China, uh, which is contiguous. And, you know, I wonder how that plays into this because China may not have agreed. It may not have wanted them to shut the border, but Vietnam for its own protection shut the border. Um, how does that work on an international relations basis? Well, that's, yeah, so I, I, let me check my resume. No, I do not yet have the Nobel Peace Prize. So <laughs> if I knew, if I could answer in our nine hours today exactly how that works, then I'm sure that would be hanging on the wall here somewhere instead of gun barrels and airplane pictures. Um, but, but that's a good example of some of the value of, of uh, ASEAN and, and the confederation or whatever the, the best description of this organization is. Because Vietnam, government and people, all know that they have to balance things and walk a tightrope with China. And, and there are some loyalties to, to China and some strong historical animosity and, and current animosity. It's a, you know, it's a conundrum for them. And Vietnam has been quite successful, one of the most successful countries in dealing with COVID and closing the borders part of it. But if they, if let's imagine ASEAN didn't exist and we were in an ASEAN pre-war and it was just Vietnam, okay, any incursion on Vietnam would have been an incursion on Vietnam, but now it's an incursion, whether it's it's coercion or some military action, which it's kind of unimaginable, but the Chinese have done it before with regard to Vietnam. Now it's an affront to ASEAN. Does it necessarily mean that there's going to be a military response because this isn't NATO? There's no Article 5, the self or the, the mutual defense element of NATO. There's no Article 5 of the ASEAN Charter. But if China were to do anything truly appalling with regard to Vietnam, they would incur, incur a negative response from all of the ASEAN member states. And I'd, I'd even include some of those like Cambodia that are a little more likely to lean China's way because it's ASEAN and, and it's an important bit of fabric that links the region together. And, makes it a little more stable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, beneficial for sure. The other thing is, um, you know, here's an organization, and I'm just going on logic without really knowing. Here's an organization which uh, is in really the heart of Asia, um, mm -hmm. outside of China, um, a very important organization um, um, of states, uh, a complex organization. Um, 
And it would, it would seem to me that the United States would have a great interest in participating with them, supporting them, uh, helping them, um, providing encouragement in every which way to them. It's a counterbalance to the power of China, um, but it's also a, it's a statement that we like you uh, and that you, you know, you'll be better off if you, uh, you know, remain friendly with us. So we, we could achieve a um, huge soft power benefit uh, in, in ASEAN if we played it right. So query, how have we been playing it over the years? Yeah, generally we have played it right. And um, it's, it's very cost effective, not that we ever think about that in the US government, but you know, again, through, the, through ASEAN, you can reach, engage, and perhaps influence 10 countries um, in a way that you may not necessarily be able to in the capitals of those countries. You can show interest in the region and kind of diplomatic collegiality, uh, but also interest and provide assistance where appropriate as APCSS did with Laos and later I believe with the Philippines after I left as director um, in, in, their, in the functioning of ASEAN. Um, and we've done that, as, as I said, maybe off camera before we started the interview, the U.S. was first to provide a fully credentialed uh, ambassador to ASEAN. I, I believe that was in 2008. And we had a fully credentialed ambassador in Nina Hitchigian, uh, just a tremendous diplomat and professional uh, who was there um, up until 2017, I believe. Like, some, like too many posts, and this is not a political statement, as, a, as I think I said in our last talk, though, I were the president, not happening. Um, the, the, one of my top priorities coming into office would to be get, to get qualified ambassadors into uh, confirmed and credentialed into posts around the world. And one of the ones that might sort of philosophically fall into a lower priority might be ASEAN, but the odds of getting an ASEAN ambassador uh, nominated and confirmed and credentialed quickly are probably greater than getting all 10 of the states done, the member states. So get that done first. Right now we have a, a charge of affairs, a, an acting, if you will, very qualified and previously served as the acting chief of mission in uh, Singapore, so, but, but there's something very different about having somebody who's a full-fledged ambassador and is credentialed and accepted by the host, in this case, the host organization, not the host nation. So step one, find somebody who's ready to be a, a killer, not in a bad way, uh, uh, diplomat and lead our mission to ASEAN. What, what, would, what would that person look like? I mean, can you, profile what you think would be an ideal candidate? Well, it's hard to say because we've get, we've, you know, we have ambassadors who've been exceedingly capable who come from business, who are simply friends of the president, name a president, who are career diplomats and might come from an uh, uh, economic advisor background or a policy advisor. So there, there's no cookie cutter, but I'd say the broader experience they had in the region and ideally with as many of the member states as possible. Um, the, the, you know, that broad experience and, and I think my first question, if I were the president asking them to, if they wanted the job would be, what do you think of ASEAN? And, so, and if they gave a lukewarm answer, not too much. <laughs> you know, uh, because, because there are a lot of people who give a lukewarm answer to ASEAN because it, you know, it's not NATO, it's not the EU. Huge yeah. yeah. in my mind. The well, yeah. population of the ASEAN countries is only 661 million people. That's kind of. Yeah, when you compare that with India at 1.4 and China at 1.5, it's it's really small. But it's the it's the core of world trade. All of the important trade in the world, one way or another. Straits of Malacca, other waterways, other sources. Um, it, it is, it's essential. The ASEAN region is essential to global trade. 
and peace and stability there is important for the world. Good relations and having influence to, for, to help uh, promote a free and open Indo-Asia Pacific there is, is central, not secondary to American goals, uh, goals that are unlikely to change later in January. Well, I, I take it from what you said that it, it is far better for the United States to have a credentialed ambassador in mm -hmm. a given country or group of countries than not. Um, yeah. But you know what? What are the risks of not having a credentialed ambassador? Um, you know what are the what's the dark side of that? And and uh, second part of my question is, um, you know, is there a good diplomatic reason to avoid appointing someone? I'll answer the second question first. No, there's no good reason. Um, why might somebody not be appointed? Well, it could be lack of the right person within the circle of the nominator, the president. Um, you know, they're all, it's, they're not, they're not a, you know, 240 million ambassador uh, type people in the U.S. There's a, there's a bunch of folks like me who aren't, who wouldn't be, but, but the risk uh, is twofold. Uh, the risk to the U.S. broadly and altruistically is we have a chance to properly influence an organization that is generally committed to the greater good, peace and stability in a very important region of the world. And I still think 661 million is a lot of people. And, 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 great, and, which, and yeah. which has uh, some say on uh, one of the yeah. most sensitive waterways and trade Absolutely. conduits in the world. Absolutely, and includes two treaty allies. Um, and as an important, a couple of important strategic partners. So, you know, that, that we want to influence in a proper way for peace and stability. And nature abhors a vacuum, and that gets to your first question. The risk is, if we're not there and appear disinterested, they may be drawn to another power source, China, and um, by necessity, because if we're not balancing Chinese ambitions to change the nature of the international order in the Indo-Asia Pacific, then, well, you know, if you're, if you live in a neighborhood where there are only drug dealers and gangsters, other malcontents and miscreants, and the, there is no order, well, those, they provide the order. And that's not a direct analogy for anybody in China who's viewing it. It's not a direct analogy, but, but China has executed, has exercised some very coercive diplomacy, economic diplomacy, and, and it's quite contrary, frankly, to the ASEAN way. Hmm. So, uh, so we need to provide a balance and work with China. I mean, there, there are times where we might be able to work with China with regard to ASEAN. Hmm. So it would be fair to say, Dan, that, that China has designs on ASEA um, and it is spending some time and diplomatic capital in dealing with ASEAN. Um, it, it, it attends their meetings, as I understand it. It, mm -hmm. it sidles up to them. Um, it wants to have some influence with them, whether it's a, you know, a, a soft power influence or maybe even a coercive influence, but as you said. But, but it, it is attending uh, and trying to enhance its relationship and, and it's, it, it's the, the, the reflection of its power on ASEAN and, and uh, it seems to be what China does everywhere. But um, query though, how does that compare with what the United States has been doing with ASEAN? Has the United States been meeting that competition? Do we spend the time um, do we, um, you know, uh, express our power and our, and our, what do you want to call it, our soft power, our morality, our, yeah. our encouragement and uh, global kindness there? Are we there as much as they are? Um, no, but, but for a reason. First of all, ASEAN engaged China and Japan and South Korea early on to expand cooper cooperation, specifically uh, economic cooperation within the region. Um, we are very present and have been for centuries in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. 
And, uh, but I would say that generally we have focused more on the bilateral relationships with the 10 member states, especially those whom are our treaty allies, Thailand and the Philippines. Uh, we put a lot of effort in Vietnam, as you and I have discussed. All that's good, but there's a unique value to, to the broader engagement with ASEAN. And we should put an emphasis on that, recognize its value. Well, I take it then uh, we're getting to the end of our discussion, but I take it nine then. hours already. <laughs> See how fast the time goes by. Wow. <laughs> that um, we, you know, we, we we have a new administration coming in uh, in a couple of weeks, um, and uh, he's going to have to figure out, you know, how to deal with this and a lot of other foreign relations issues. Um, he's got a pretty Akamai uh, Secretary of State. Uh, but still, you know, Asia is a very complex and uh, people who have been close to Asia like you, you know, you know a lot that you could, you could help him with or at least uh, appoint him to. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are on what Joe Biden should be doing with respect to, um, you know, ASEAN and for that matter, the members of ASEAN in order to improve our, you know, our position there, our influence there. Um, you know, one, of course, as you mentioned, would be to appoint a, a, a credentialed ambassador right away. Uh, find one. I mean, surely the President yeah, of the United States. Uh, they, they're out one. there. Absolutely. Yeah, they're out there. I mean, look at the universities. Look at the retired yeah. military like you. Uh, there, there must be a lot of people who could qualify. If he opens his, sure. his door, he'll, he'll have a flood of possibilities. But the question is, um, what else? What else do we do? How else do we play the, the card? Because we have a card. They like us, I think, from what you say, they like us and, and we like them. APCSS, uh, you know, has been yeah. part of that connection, I think. Absolutely. And um, so we... I, I, my advice would be, I um, mean, this is not a political statement. Every administration is different and they're, they all have good points and bad points. And I, I shy away from politics, except when I go vote. <laughs> um, but as an observer, uh, I'll first I'll talk about a Republican administration. I thought George W. Bush did an extraordinary job of finding qualified career diplomats and friends and businessmen to be ambassadors throughout Asia Pacific. And I saw that. And they're very impressive. And he did it fairly ex expeditiously. I thought the um, Obama administration was very excellent at getting into the region by doing the hard work of going to meetings. And that sounds a little silly, but they were present in the room. They were aggressively present in the room. And uh, that, uh, that, that mere presence, when people are talking about important things and unimportant things, is extraordinarily valuable. So get a qualified ambassador and be in the room. On that point, you know, um, uh, was it this morning? Um, the the House uh, adopted uh, new rules, and they also uh, re reelected Nancy uh, Pelosi as uh, as the leader, as the, as the speaker. But one of the rules they adopted, which I find really really interesting in this context, um, is to allow voting in the House of Representatives by 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 virtual voting by Zoom, and the like. Um, and I think that's probably going to change the way Congress functions. Uh, and I think it's probably a good thing. It's a fa facilitating change. But likewise, there have been a number of meetings in which the United States has participated, maybe sometimes by uh, officials who are too low level as against mm -hmm. the officials from the members of ASEAN, which is, I think, one thing we ought to consider. Um, but, but now, with, given that, um, sounds to me like the meetings you're talking about, the presence you're talking about, the you know on the ground, so to speak, relationships that we need to have with ASEAN and its members and so many other countries in the world uh, can be, are being facilitated by virtual meetings or virtual attendance at meetings. What do you think? Yeah, I'm throwing a flag on that, Jay. Uh, the virtual presence is better than no presence at all. But virtual presence is actual absence. And you don't build relationships over Zoom. You and I can have 
the kind of conversations we have because we know each other from being in the same room. If we just met this way, I don't think it would be the same. And I'd cite a political example going back to your rule change in the House of Representatives. You know, I had the pleasure, the extraordinary honor of, of seeing Senator Daniel K. in a way in person many times in an official capacity. And um, more times than not, he was with Senator Ted Stevens. Senator Inouye, of course, Democrats, Senator Stevens, of course, are Republicans. And they had a relationship that was an, a, a really an exemplar of how legislators from either side of the aisle should work together and be collegial, even when they strongly disagreed. And there were times they strongly disagreed. You don't get to that on Zoom or Facebook. So, so yeah, with a balance, better than, better than nothing, yes. Better than being in the room, no. And so I, um, you know, the, the, it's, it hopefully will work well for the House of Representatives. We'll see. But we should remember that we're people. And, and all of us, I think, during the pandemic have had something of a sense of loss of our interpersonal interaction. And um, now I don't think that should become the norm. Let me go back before the nine hours were up to, uh, to something you said about the level of the US represented in the room. So if the diplomatic equivalent of a major is in with a brigadier general equivalent of a diplomat from a host country or somewhere else, is that idea? Nope. Is it better than nothing? Absolutely. Um, and it, it, it's a wonderful opportunity for the major equivalent but it also shows that we're at least sending somebody. Yeah. That's what we've got to do. So many things yep. to do starting so well, soon. There always are. There always are. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting time we live in. It's a time for uh, reconsideration, reimagination, reinvention. And it's very exciting going forward. Well, thank yep. you, General. Uh, General Jay, Jay, my pleasure. Uh, always enjoyed talking to you. We'll, uh, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll pick through these countries uh, in later shows and we'll examine Absolutely. them one by one and learn so much about them from you. Yeah, Thank and I'll you. try to get more photos together to keep it interesting for my side. Absolutely. Thank you so right. much. Aloha. Aloha. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.